Hello, and thanks for joining the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series today. This is, in fact, the last event uh, in this academic year. My name is Raphael Fazel, and I'm the Executive Director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. I see a few people in the, the uh, participants list who are here for the first time, so I'm just going to say a few words about the format of these events. We will start with a presentation that will last for about 30 to 45 minutes, and that will then leave us with around 40 minutes or so for Q&A and discussion. We will end at 6.30 p.m. UK time. You're all warmly invited to participate in the discussion, if you like. In case you do want to participate, say by asking a question or making a comment, um, can I please ask you to use the raise hand function, you will find it under the reactions button. It's a little smiley face in your Zoom app. Um, once you've raised your hands, I can then go through those hands and allow you to ask your questions directly to our speakers. That's usually a nice way of creating a, a, a dialogue. Um, if you'd prefer, you can also use the chat function instead, if that's easier for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I'll be muting all the microphones until that point. In case you need to leave early or if you'd like to send this talk to a friend who couldn't join, we are recording this uh, um, the talk part of the event, not the discussion bit, and you can later access it on our website or on our YouTube channel. Okay, with this out of the way, um, I'd now like to introduce our distinguished speakers today. I will keep it as short as possible because recounting their impressive CVs could easily take the whole of the session, so I'll keep it short. We have the great pleasure of, in fact, having two speakers with us today. The first is Professor Justin Marceau, who is the Brooks Institute Research Professor of Law at the University of Denver. Professor Marceau is the author of more than three dozen academic articles on topics including habeas corpus, the death penalty, free speech, and the intersection of criminal law and animal protection. His first book, Beyond Cages, was published by Cambridge University Press in 20. 19. He's currently co-authoring another book that provides a socio-legal examination of undercover investigations, as well as another book about empirical research in animal law, both of which um, are forthcoming with Cambridge University Press. In addition to his scholarly work, Professor Marceau has litigated death penalty appeals and was a lead counsel in the ag-gag litigation in the US. He is a member of the Jury Instruction Committee for the Federal Court of Appeals, as well as a frequent consultant on pending litigation. Turning to our second speaker, Laurie Green is the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy at Wesleyan University, where she is also a professor of feminist, gender and sexuality studies and science in society. Professor Green was previously Lawrence Rockefeller Visiting Professor of Distinguished Teaching at Princeton University. She is the author and editor of over a dozen books, including Ethics of Captivity, published with OUP in 2014, Entangled Empathy, published with Lantern in 2015, Critical Terms for Animal Studies, published by the Chicago University Press, and Ethics and Animals, an introduction, uh, which was just last year um, published in its second edition with Cambridge University Press. Even more recent books of hers include Animal Crisis, which she co authored with Alice Crary, who was also a speaker in the Talking Animals series previously. This book was out just this week uh, with Polity Press. In addition to her writing, Professor Grun is also a leader in prison education and she's taught at different correctional institutions throughout the US. We are delighted that Professor Marceau and Grun have chosen the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series to launch their newest edited volume entitled Carceral Logics human incarceration and animal captivity. The book is out with the Cambridge University Press and is available open access. For those who, like me, will want to read all its contributions after this event. So it's my great pleasure to hand over to um, Laurie and Justin now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a terrific introduction. Um, so we just wanted to start by um, giving you uh, just a little sense of how we came to um, work on this project. So I'll just give you a sense of what we'll talk about. 
Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we came to work together on the project. Um, I'll say a few things about how we understand the term carceral logics. And then we're um, going to share with you um, sort of what's in the book, why, um, how it's organized, and uh, sort of what the key features of the book are. And then what we'll do is talk about each of our contributions to the book. Um, Justin will talk about his chapter, I'll talk about my chapter. Um, but let me just say that both of us have been working and thinking about the range of legal, philosophical um, ideas um, that arise in animal protection um, for a while. And you mentioned Justin's Beyond Cages in 2019 and My Ethics of Captivity um, in 2014. Um, and in Ethics of Captivity was a collection that I put together because I was concerned that there wasn't enough attention being um, paid in a scholarly way towards the topic and the ethical concerns that are raised by captivity. Um, but I didn't want it to simply be about either exclusively human captivity, which is a something that I am very um, involved in thinking about, I'll say a bit about that in a minute, but also animal captivity. Um, but both of us, we met in uh, 2019 at a Brooks Institute uh, retreat and decided that we were increasingly concerned about what we think of as the punitive turn in animal protection. And so um, part of um, our decision to work together on putting this book together was in largely in reaction to that. And from my point of view, I've been working with incarcerated people for um, over a decade. And I think that there's just a sense that um, the conditions of captivity that humans are in in the US um, are not attended to. Uh, well enough. And Justin's work in Beyond Cages um, sort of complements the concerns that I've had on the ground working um, with people who are incarcerated, a variety of people who are incarcerated, both men and women, both. So I'll turn it over to Justin to say a few words about that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lori. And, and thanks, uh, Raphael and Sean. We are really excited to um, be able to sort of launch this book and this is hopefully the first of uh, many talks. We're planning a, a series of talks that will, some of which will include some more co-authors and, and some activists on the ground, but we're, we're really interested in your feedback today and glad for, for everyone that was able to attend because um, we're kind of, uh, you know, the book is, 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 is large as if any of you have uh, been able to look at it and there's a lot of different themes running through it. Um, you know, many more than we'll be able to, to even cover today. Uh, there's a lot of different sort of subtopics of carcerality. I thought I would say just a couple of autobiographical things to kind of put this book in context, some of which um, Lori touched on. But, um, you know, my progression has, has been kind of an interesting one in that I came at both criminal law and animal law in, in, in almost uh, hap hap haphazard or whimsical ways. Um, you know, I came to animals and the, and the idea that animals deserved protection really through law school, um, which I don't think happens for most people, but I'm a true believer that, that education and even legal education can play a role in shaping the way that we think about animals and, and their, their status in society, because I, it really was the case that, you know, I'm just grateful to um, Harvard Law School for offering the course and David Wolfson for having taught it uh, in my third year of law school. I would not, this would not have been on my radar. Um, I think as a kid and really until the end of law school, I had an approach to animals that was, it was really simplistic and just sort of viewed them as lovable and kind. And of course you would like the, the baby cow on the farm. I grew up in Montana and you would like the, the rabbit, um, but you would also eat them and you would you know, expect that they would be used for your ends. Um, you know, and in some ways this is, um, you know, my, my view really going into law school was that there, were, there was no such thing as factory farms. And I probably approached animals in a way that is similar to David Favor thinks about animals in, in respecting animals, which was just one of his recent books that as long as we're treating them well, um, you know, to a certain extent, um, we could consume them, we could eat them. And it was really law school that changed my, my perspective on that. And at the same time, I grew up in a state and in a country and in a context where I was really taught that the way that we change behavior and the way that we 
keep ourselves safe and the way that we um, make the world better is through policing and punishment. Um, if crime was down, I remember having conversations at the dinner table with my parents, uh, we would credit it to the effectiveness of law enforcement. And if things seem dangerous in our community or across the country somewhere, it must be because we didn't have enough law enforcement. I mean, this is really sort of the way that I, that I grew up. And it wasn't until law school um, that these two themes both sort of collided. Um, I had mentors, like I said, David Wolfson, but Charles Ogletree, a long time, um, one of the greats, one of the pillars of American criminal law and Harvard Law professor, um, was willing to sort of sit down with me and talk through the many pedestrian and naive um, thoughts I had about criminal law and, and how it was there to, to keep us safe. Um, and so through all of that, um, I came to think that I wanted to both um, be compassionate and, and sort of embrace persons who um, had the flaws and neglected their animal or abused their animal. But more importantly, I was concerned with how do we um, improve the status of animals in the law? And simultaneously, how do we find ways to think compassionately um, about our, our justice system? And as I started to work in both of these movements, I, it didn't take long for me to find a lot of points of conflict here. Um, you know, as I came to sort of age in animal law and animal rights in the early 2000s, there was a general sense that we were in a war on crime, that we were, um, that certainly it was part of the, the successful campaign, campaign of animal law to push for more incarceration, right? And I've had lots of people say, well, that was never really the case. We've never really cared about incarceration. We don't get that many points of incarceration. If you look at the book, right, uh, even Paula Tarankow's chapter documents the tens of thousands to the hundreds of thousands of animal cases a year. I mean, I think we don't have a sense that that's happening in the US, but there are actually a lot of prosecutions. And I do think that um, whatever else you think about prosecution is not non-existent and it was a serious point. And now there's, there's many people I think that, that push back on Lori and I and say, well, it's never been as bad as you think. Um, but I was just looking at a newsletter this morning and it was, this is from 2008, the organization said, quote, our famous bumper sticker says, abuse an animal, go to jail. And we mean it, end quote. Um, so taking them at their word, that was really where I jumped off in, in Beyond Cages was that we did mean it. We did in fact mean what we were saying, that we wanted a more carceral space in animal law. And what did that look like? What were the normative implications for that, um, particularly for humans? And what do we know about the criminology of such a step? Um, and so then um, I did, as Laurie said, have the, the fortune to, to meet her in person, having read a um, couple of her books before that and uh, in 2019. And I thought that the legal community would benefit just as I had benefited from her philosophy uh, in sort of seeing some of her work. And so we, we kind of strove to do a project that combines law and philosophy. Um, and there's, there's some other topics in there as well, but that was the goal. And um, in many ways it is for me, continuation of some of the thoughts and progressing of the thoughts that I had in Beyond Cages and that I had when reading books like Ethics of Captivity. So we were delighted that um, the scholars and, and, and lawyers who agreed to join the book did. Um, it, was a, it was a big ask. We did um, workshop chapters, we talked it through. Um, and I'll say we tried very hard to present a set of perspectives that define um, carcerality um, in its best light, regardless of of you know the, the the perspective, so we we really did. If you if you start to read the book from cover to cover, um, there's a there's a lot of. I mean, we asked four different persons to write chapters that would take the best position in terms of arguing for a, a sort of pro punitive approach, and we included those right at the front of the book. Um, so we haven't shied away from from any of it, and we're we're just. Uh, I think that's the kind of setup that I will say for the book. And then, Laurie, do you want to talk a little bit about what we mean by carceral logics? I do, um, and I just want to add that. Um, so there is what Justin just said is a really important feature of our um, sort of motivation for the book, this, I, this idea that abuse an animal go to jail. Um, but there's also a very sort of, there, this can happen both in sort of cases of animal uh, abuse and animal neglect. Um, and there's also a, a more administrative sense of the law in which these kinds of issues are in play, but um, we'll say a little bit more when we go through the, the sections to tell you what's in there. But there is a sense in which um, there is a really important way in which uh, the law can help animals. What we're 
just in a, and my intersecting interests are really have to do with a certain framework of criminal responsibility vis-a-vis -vis treatments of animals and what the response to that ab abuse is. Of course, we're very concerned about animal abuse. So, I mean, this is something that motivates both of us to do the work that we do, but we just are disagreeing with many other scholars about the right response to that and whether or not the carceral space is the correct response. So let me say a little bit about what carceral logics are understood to be. Um, there's two ways of understanding, at least two ways of understanding what is happening when we're thinking about carceral logics, the title of the book. One way of thinking about carceral logics is to focus on the logics part of the carceral logics, right? So the idea is that you look at how it is that carceral institutions um, or captive institutions, that could be prisons, of course, those are carceral institutions, but also institutions for those who are um, otherwise need to be incapacitated because of, say, um, mental uh, defects or, or things of that nature. Um, and also, of course, animals are in all sorts of carceral spaces, factory farms and zoos, good examples. Um, but the logics of carceral logics in this way of thinking has to do with the ways that these institutions are organized. So in the case of the criminal legal system, you'd look at the laws, the rules, the ways that the court systems are designed, how, um, how the law is practiced within the framework of courtrooms, how policing is, is conducted, different, um, the different logic you might say between policing in the UK and policing in the US. I mean, we just, there's the, that would be about a different logic. Um, and you could see that in the practice of policing um, and how prisons are organized um, as well. Um, so the prisons that I work in, the men's prisons are maximum security prisons. Um, the, the conditions of captivity in those maximum um, security prisons are extreme. This is a kind of logic where there's constant surveillance. If it was a less, um, so there's different levels of prisons in the US. So if it was a, a less secure, um, Fit place, the surveillance might be less. That's part of the logic of these carceral institutions. That's what we mean in one sense by carceral logics. Um, what we mean also is that there's another sense of carceral logics, which is about the carcerality. So it's an attitude um, that the emphasis here, instead of being on logics, is on the carceral, if, it, if this helps. And one of the ways of thinking about that is to think about how carceral thinking informs our social relationships. And so here, the, again, surveillance is a very important feature of um, what we might think of as the carceral, but um, we're not talking about surveillance within a carceral system, but it might be surveillance outside of a carceral system. Um, and so there's that kind of uh, concern. There's also um, ideas about constraint and what you're able to do and what you're not able to do. Um, what you're allowed uh, to think about and what you're sort of, if you think about these things, um, there might be a certain kind of pushback against them. So for example, as we'll talk about more, but um, you know, Justin mentioned that we get pushback from our view of thinking about things, um, how to respond to animal cruelty and animal abuse in a non-carceral way. Um, there's a lot of pushback that we get from that because the carceral, the punishment establishment has seeped into people's consciousness. That's sort of the way of thinking about um, carceral. And so part of what um, we're concerned about is the way in which um, that carceral thinking has crept into a lot of activism in the animal protection world. Um, and the idea is, as Justin said, hurt an animal, go to jail. But also it's like, I've heard um, animal advocates in the courtroom talking about, you know, basically um, put these people in prison and have them suffer, quote unquote, prison justice, the way the animals that they've harmed have, um, have suffered. And so this is a kind of carceral retributivist attitude that we're, Justin and I are, are very much um, opposed to. But that's a very brief 
sort of sense of what we mean by carceral logics. And we're happy um, to talk more about that um, in the uh, Q&A. But let's turn to talking a little bit about the book. Justin, you're muted. Coming, here I come. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Lori. I think that's right. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's great. I always enjoy hearing Lori um, talk about that concept. I think it's, you know, some of my law colleagues, um, which I, who I'm close to, I should say, it's a, it's a nice thing, but are, like tease me both with both terms. The like carceral is uh, such a cerebral term. Nobody knows what it means. And then logic. <laughs> um, one of my close colleagues was, was mocking that there's no, like anyone who puts an S on logic is a fool. And, uh, but I think that there is something to it, right? I mean, I actually, I, I think that the logic here is meant to indicate a plural, a, a plurality of thinking about the, these topics. So, so, I mean, it is, it is not a, it's not a title we took lightly, but, uh, but yes, we, we, we know it. Um, so section one of the book, um, we mentioned some of the key things in this, in this section already, or I highlighted them. What I wanted to say about section one, um, for those who are going to look at the book from, from front to end, is we tried to create a nice historical context here and situate um, the, the debate <clears throat> about carcerality in animal law. And doing so involved both a historical look through historian Paul Taranko, who I'll touch on in a moment, but it also involved us doing um, what I think is taking up, as I said, the strongest arguments uh, in support of a punitive approach to animal law. And we took that really seriously. Um, I was reading a memorial for uh, the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and one of her former clerks attributed to her this idea that the most important thing you can do um, in research and in, in, in lawyering is to take up your uh, opponent's strongest argument, to not look for the weak argument or the, uh, you know, the sort of straw man. And we really tried to do that. Um, and I think that, that anybody would disagree with, and no, nobody could really disagree with that. I mean, we, we sought out people here who vehemently disagree with us. And if you read the chapters, um, I think some of that comes across and, and we're happy with that. I and mean, Professor Richard Cup, the longtime animal law contributor and scholar, he's at uh, Pepperdine University, Pamela Frasch wrote a chapter, you know, the first Dean of Animal Law in the country. Um, and uh, Professor at Lewis and Clark. Ashley Beck is a full-time prosecutor and the, the point of contact for all animal cruelty prosecutions for the entire um, city of Denver. And these authors all wrote really provocative pieces saying, look, um, we think that this approach is good and that it works. And here is our best effort to explain why it works. And it goes from sort of tepid to, to quite, um, strong in the support. And so I'll flag a couple of things about those chapters. But first, um, I did want to say, I mean, this is related to something Lori and I have already said, touched on a couple of times. There is this notion of like, well, is it real? Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? Is, is, is racism in the prosecution problem? Is, is it, have we ever really wanted to send people to jail? And so part of it is just putting this in a historical context and saying like, let's capture this moment. That's what academics do is try to create, build a body of knowledge. And so part of what we wanted to do is say, this is something that has been happening. Here is how it's perceived. Here is how some people who support it um, would represent it. And here is how historians have documented this, this account, right? It's, it's not the, it, it can't be exhausted, but we wanted to memorialize this uh, perspective, this perspective, because it is part of animal law, whether you think it is central or not central, um, the idea of punishment as a, as, a, as a good thing in animal law exists. And so we tried to memorialize that. Um, Paula Taranko is a great historian. She wrote what we put as the first chapter in the book. And one of the things that I would, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a really fascinating chapter, just given time, I'm not gonna sort of talk about it, but there were a couple of things I wanted to touch on about that chapter for those of you who are looking at the book. Um, it turns out, and one of the things that Paul illustrates quite brilliantly is that um, the turn away from education and the turn away from outreach on behalf of animals through local SPCAs and humane societies really changed um, in the late or mid 19th century after the abolition of slavery. And it turns out that there was a shift in advocacy that can be tied to, in Paula's view, um, a really nasty form of racism. That was the sort of African-Americans who were being emancipated could not be trusted to behave well around animals, that we would not trust them to not be able to engage in neglect and abuse. And so there was this ability, much like the um, sort of narratives that the South and slavery were not so bad, there was this ability um, for the South to pivot and former slave owners to sort of try and buck or defy the narrative that they were backwards thinking or that they were cruel people. 
by really jumping headfirst into local humane societies and taking them over and saying sort of this paternalistic view, like we can show you what's good. So the book, the chapter goes through a number of examples of sort of the daughters of the Confederacy and the sisters of the Confederacy leading local humane societies and talking about how persons of color were not gonna be able to be trusted with their animals, right? And I think it's a, it's a really compelling example of what we might think of as humane washing. This idea of taking the former Confederacy and then painting it with this ability to be the most humane and teaching the North how to treat uh, animals better. Um, so, I mean, I'll just, I was gonna share one line. I had my, my copy of the book here that I thought was, um, Paula says that Southerners professed that the problem of animal cruelty was essentially a race problem that could be solved by prosecution and Jim Crow politics, right? Um, I mean, it's really, it's, it's a really interesting history that I don't think a lot of us have given much thought to. Um, given the time constraints, I'll just quickly flag two other chapters in the book because I think they are particularly timely. One is by Ben Levin, who is um, a leading criminal law scholar in the United States. He's at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and he wrote a chapter about called Carceral Progressivism and Animal Victims. Uh, ben is a beautiful and concise writer, and he sort of wrote this chapter about other areas where progressives have been interested in and invested in the idea of carcerality as a solution to a progressive cause. And so, whereas other chapters in the book, including the chapter by Pam Frosch, worry that the very critique of carceral animal law risks undermining the progress we have made for animals, Ben argues that the message sending function of the criminal law is much more complicated than we imagine, that the message is not being received by the public in the way that we think it is, and uses examples. Um, so whereas Pamela Frosch says, quote, the critiques of felony laws, or excuse me, the, the felony laws represent, quote, hard fought advances for animals, Ben warns us that based on his study of criminal law, it's, quote, a mistake to think we could ever achieve positive ends to the criminal prosecution approach. And he's an outsider to animal law, right? And as part of what we wanted to accomplish in this book is having scholars who don't think about animals come and engage with this field and say, well, what do you think? I mean, you are a scholar who has never thought about animal law and what do you think? Uh, so it's really interesting. And I think, uh, I don't wanna, it's, it's hard to speak for the authors, but I think that um, this is a really engaging chapter and I would uh, encourage everyone to, to look at this first section. But Laura, you wanna talk about section two? Yeah, I'll follow up on that. So the, the, the first section um, of the book is called Carceral Thinking in Animal Protection Justifications and Repudiations. And that's what Justin was just talking about. The second section of the book is called Animal Law and Context, The Limits of Carceral Strategies. And what we tried to do in this particular section is bring together experts um, who are not experts in animal law per se, but experts in other areas, um, both of social justice movements, um, and particularly thinking of, for example, immigration um, and the war on drugs and bringing the war on drugs in context to the war on animal cruelty. Um, and a fantastic chapter that um, I really love and learned a lot from, they're all good, but this one is called Humanizing Animals, Dehumanizing Humans by Aya Gruber, who's um, also really well known for a book that she just published, um, which is an anti-carceral feminist analysis. Um, there's also important, exciting stuff on captivity um, and solitary confinement, um, as well as um, work on um, domestic uh, violence questions and how to think about that. And then Justin will talk more about his chapter um, from this section as well in a little bit. Um, but basically, the idea here is to sort of think through um, how and whether the carceral strategies that have been employed um, in these other areas have actually elevated or created problems for sort of quote unquote victims of certain crimes. Um, so victims of domestic violence and their advocates, for example, they have sort of used the criminal law to advance social change objectives in a variety of ways, but there's some very deep problems with how and in what conditions this kind of use of the law has actually worked. So on the one hand, um, the social justice advocacy for um, sort of, excuse me if this is this, here's a trigger warning, so I, forgive me, but the, if you are in a marriage and you're sexually assaulted or raped by your husband, the, the, the fact that this is now against the law is something that has been very, very useful. 
But we do also know that the carceral strategy of getting restraining orders on um, violent partners actually can escalate the violence as opposed to minimize the violence. So these are some of the things um, that are unintended consequences, you might say, or limitations of the carceral strategies that are happening in these different kinds of settings. Um, and so these chapters are um, address what we can learn a tremendous amount from social justice lawyering in other areas. So that's part of what's going on in this section. And I'll let Justin talk about the next section too. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, section three, I think is the, it, it, we call it impacts of carceral spaces. And it is in many ways, the, the most sweeping. It's, it's not a chapter about um, is the criminal system good or bad, right? We're not sort of doing, we weren't doing a tally of like who's winning and who's losing in the, in the, the county chapters or pro, how many chapters are con. We tried to put the best foot forward for, and, and, and give a really good perspective to the persons who defend a punitive approach. Uh, and we opened the book with that. But we spent chapter, the section three rather, talking about the idea of carcerality and what it means, not so much the criminal system, but these carceral logics for animals, right? And so we have chapters here from scientists, right? Like Jessica Pierce and Mark Beckoff talking about what it means. What is good and bad confinement? Is there such a thing as good confinement to restore wildlife? So it's truly the idea of carceral logic, surveillance, and detention and the like in the animal context. And so a couple of chapters that I'll just, just mention quickly. Um, Manisha Decca writes a chapter about zoos and aquaria um, that, that strikes me as really timely. She writes about the ways that these profit seeking entities um, use animal carcerality to profit, but they soften the edges of the carcerality um, by inviting kids and by in promising sort of marketing to kids and by promising um, an educational um, output that we're going to learn something, right? And so in the context of, of the present moment, this is really quite interesting because in 2019, the Canadian parliament made it illegal to use whales and dolphins in performances, right? Sort of a, a in some ways a massive legal step forward, but apparently um, clinging to the idea that this could all be educational, that this would help us understand the natural world. Um, an aquarium in Canada, marine land, continues to do dolphin performances, right? So Animal Justice just within the last month released footage of da dolphins dancing to uh, pop music with trainers. Uh, and the only possible legal argument is that they think that this is, is not for entertainment, but for education, right? This is for conservation, to have the dolphins carrying trainers and doing dances to, to music. Uh, so I think Manisha's chapter is really quite uh, illuminating in that way. Another chapter that I was going to flag is one by David Pello, who is an environmental studies professor, actually chair of the department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'll just say very quickly, again, I think this is timely because in recent weeks, um, investigators um, looked into a California chicken producer um, in, in Petaluma, California, and the facility, I think, supplies chicken, I'm pretty sure, to, to Whole Foods and definitely to Amazon. And the state veterinarian herself found that the birds at the facility, many of them, were in such bad condition that they couldn't move, right? They had wounds so severe, uh, bone exposed, muscle exposed, they were never going, they were going to just die in place. And so this chicken supply, which markets itself as free range and, and you know, all these fancy terms um, were exposed. And now, right, just in the, in the last several weeks, 58 investigators from that facility have been charged with multiple felonies for exposing the, the process that the state's own veterinarian said was cruel. Uh, and so this is kind of a reminder to us of what the criminal law does, right? It defines what is good and bad. Um, these persons who exposed the, did take, took actions in, in favor of transparency are now being labeled um, potential felons. And David Pello's chapter sort of says that the activists who are charged, he talks a lot about the idea of um, prosecution of political activists as a tool for silencing and discrediting um, those persons who are trying to make major strides for the movement. It's a way of uh, impeding any um, kind of momentum or radical change or paradigm shifts because the public reacts to these ideas of um, horrible footage and grotesque images 
But if you can downplay it by saying, well, yeah, yeah, but those are felons. Those are felons that did that, right? Which is, of course, it's, it's, it's a term we've come up with. We've defined them as felons. But if you say, well, we can't really believe them, they're felons, that's quite powerful. And David Pello is writing here about this idea of the intersection of carcerality and activists. What does it mean to be facing the, forcing the law's focus onto people who are trying to create transparency and then calling them um, felons and kind of calls them political prisoners? Um, but Lori, who are yeah, and I just wanted to say one other thing about um, one of the chapters in the in the third section is really illuminating in another way. This is a, a chapter that's written by so sociologist Kelly, Kelly Struthers Montford. And what she does in her chapter, which is really important to understand, is that she shows the way that animals are actually harmed by prisons. And I, I mean, that's one of the things that she does, that animals are harmed when we increase the number of people that are in prison, that animals are harmed around prisons by their um, existence and the kind of waste that they produce. Um, so wild animals are harmed. Obviously, animals are harmed within prisons because many of the prisons themselves sort of have their own farms that they, they produce. In Canada, they're doing this a lot more. Um, and also, um, animals are, are harmed um, in food production as well as in pest control. So um, it's not that sending somebody who abuses animals to prison means that you're now saving animals. That's, I think, a really important and interesting sort of feature that's not often mentioned. But the fourth version, and I'll just be really quick about the fourth, fourth section, which is called Challenging Captivity and Changing Carceral Thinking. And in this, um, in this section, what we do is we have a variety of um, scholars thinking about what it would look like to imagine a different way of thinking about um, the carceral system. So it challenges us to think beyond um, the kind of carceral thinking that has captured, at least in the United States, has sort of captured our political imagination, right? And so how can we recognize the harms that this kind of thinking does to um, both humans and non-humans. And so part of what we um, are able to think about in this section through various um, uh, articles that are here is whether what um, prisoners' rights might look like, whether habeas corpus um, is um, useful or not useful in uh, litigating for animals, um, and also how to imagine the animal rights movement as a civil rights movement. Um, so this is a really important section because what it does is it has social justice activists um, and cause lawyers sort of trying to elevate the status of animals, um, but also pushing against the logic that has motivated a good portion of the sort of animal law world lately. And just to go back to some of what Justin was saying about timeliness, it's, it seems that there's a great excitement um, for an uh, increase in having animals seen as victims um, in the courtroom is somehow going to elevate them in, the in our minds, in our political imagination. So if you think about the movement to have um, animals elevated as victims, um, you're still participating in a carceral logic is what we would argue. Um, and that that is, first of all, there's an empirical question about whether in fact that's true. But second of all, there's an important sense in which is victimhood really the way we want to be thinking about our relationships with other animals? Is elevating the status of animals to victimhood really what we're after. So part of the, chap part of the chapter's work um, in this section is trying to challenge how it is that we conceptualize um, political change. I think that's a, a one way to put it. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, given the time, I'm gonna talk very briefly. Uh, Raphael, you can cut us off, but I, I don't want to, uh, hopefully we've given a taste of, of what's in the book. We did wanna sort of share some of our own research in the book. Um, we actually have a lot of our voice in the book because we wrote five separate introductions, one introduction for each um, section of the book and a general introduction. And then we each wrote a chapter. Um, but I'll just say a few things very quickly about my, my chapter and what I was trying to accomplish. Um, one of the things that I was trying to do in my chapter is engage the animal protection field 
with a literature that we don't um, often see other than in this fight between rights versus welfare, which is not something we're trying to get into here. Uh, but the idea that sometimes um, reformist reforms, those reforms that don't challenge the structure or the system can end up propping up the system. And so again, we've seen that debate played out a million different ways in the, in the rights versus welfare context. But what about in the context of incremental progress for animals whilst trying to keep a picture on the, our, our eyes on the bigger prize? And I argue in the chapter that, that we could be falling into that trap. So I have a few different examples, but one of the examples that I use in the chapter is, um, and there's a couple of groups that have done these over years, so it's not, it's not a single group, but um, I've looked at, at, I think, three different sets of them, but ranking systems, right? How do we rank states in terms of their animal laws? And how, how, does, that, how does that work? And what should we think about that? So one group organized um, or, or, or advertised its rankings by saying, quote, what are the best states in which to abuse an animal? So um, again, as, if you are thinking about, well, how would we know who has the best laws? That's a catchy title, right? So, so where are the best states to abuse an animal? And we have these rankings. And then we might say, well, what kind of behavior do the rankings promote or incentivize? And I explain one example in the chapter where I think that this is, is perhaps doing um, more harm than good. And it's a, it's a very concrete criminal example. So in the 2020, the state of Iowa, um, quote unquote, updated its felony law. It updated its felony law by reducing the level of culpability that was required for a conviction. And it increased the penalty, among other things. And the state senator who sponsored the bill, so again, this is Iowa, said, quote, what we are trying to solve here with this bill is Iowa being one of the lowest ranked states in regards to animal abuse, end quote. So Iowa is directly responding to the movement's ranking and hierarchy of what matters. And they created a, a more um, carceral felony. We could talk again and question and answer about whether higher penalties mean longer sentences or not, what, we, what that means. But, um, but what I point out in the chapter is that there's something of an uncomfortable irony here in having Iowa jump up the rankings in the view of the animal groups that are being pushed out to the public um, because Iowa is a state with one of the highest concentrations of factory farms in the country. And it is able to use the movement's own rhetoric to say it's improving, that things are getting better. In 2020, the very year that they jumped in the rankings, according to the movement itself, um, they prosecuted a DXE investigator who did one of the most powerful undercover investigations, Matt Johnson, in decades, exposed ventilation shutdown, the practice of cooking animals to death as a euthanasia technique. They're prosecuting him. Um, and they passed a third version of an ag gag law all in that year. But they jumped in the rankings. Right? Iowa went up by our system. So um, I use this in the chapter to sort of point out that sometimes right, it's easy to say, well, there's no, there's no downside to criminal law. At the very least, it's positive. And I just say, well, we should at least have a conversation about that. We should at least talk about the distraction effect, the displacement effect, the ability for a state like Iowa to run ads saying we're moving up the rankings while doing things like this and homing more capos than anywhere else. The other thing I do in the chapter, and I'm not going to go into this in detail now, um, is I say, and, and again, this is partially just to provoke conversation and debate because um, I expect that I will learn as much from those who push back as I, as I can, can offer, but is the idea that a critique of incarceration only, which is what we're here, well, Justin, how many people are locked up? Numbers that the movement itself has never bothered to gather. Uh, but a critique of incarceration itself would actually let the movement off too easy. And I gather here a series of empirical and qualitative examples. Like what happens when we are saying, well, we're not doing anything carceral because all we're doing is imposing fines and fees and probation. And I point out that in some states, two thirds of the jail population is probation violations. I point out that most of the warrants are for unpaid fines. So a civil fine could result in substantial incarceration in the US. And in fact, right, point out two examples where we have law enforcement, animal control going door to door in low income neighborhoods asking to see vaccine papers for your pet. And imagine that, many of us don't have the vaccine papers on hand. If you don't have that paper on hand, they issue a citation. Uh, if you don't pay the citation, your animal is often impounded. Um, so I go through examples where persons are cited for not having vaccines, are cited for tethering their dog, are cited and merely fined 
um, for some other civil or quasi criminal offense and their animal is impounded. And in some of the examples, the animal is euthanized, right? It's killed. So we have the, in some ways, the epitome of what, what folks in the movement think of as anti-carceral. Just pay some money, come on, pay your money. Um, and then you know, we're, we're done with this. And yet the person can end up incarcerated and the animal can end up dead, right? Uh, and so I walk through that and sort of talk through some of the, the quantitative numbers, but I'll, I'll leave it there for my, for my chapter. Yeah, so we're running low on time and I have all sorts of things I wanna say. Yeah. So, um, I, well, one of the things I do wanna say because I think it, 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 it relates to both Justin's chapter and my chapter. Um, so let me just say it, uh, even though it's off sort of off script. And that is um, just to reiterate what, um, what Justin was just talking about in terms of the, the animal law um, movements idea that, oh, we're gonna be um, non-carceral by imposing other kinds of um, punishment, for example, fines, as he was just saying, or um, not, have, not sending people to prison, maybe just having them with a felony on their record, but no, no prison time. And I've been following a very high profile case here in Connecticut that's become um, sort of, uh, I think, a test case for the, um, the court appointed animal advocacy programs that are spreading around the country in the US. And it's a test case in a variety of ways and Justin and I are working on other um, another project on this. But one of the things that's very, very clear and that the judge said clearly is um, when he was sentencing this particular um, defendant, Heidi Luters, was that whether or not he um, put her in prison for this particular egregious um, neglect of these animals, um, she's going to have this on her record for the rest of her life. And that's going to mean that she can't do a variety of things. So the notion that someone is carceral is not being carceral by not advocating going to prison, I think importantly misses uh, ways in which this, the carceral system, the criminal legal system has very widespread tentacles and it's not merely bringing somebody to prison that constitutes carcerality. In my chapter, I talk about abolition, which is a, a very controversial topic, abolition of prisons um, in particular, but I'm, I, I really do focus on the very obvious, and I share it, um, effective, um, when I say effective with an A, or emotional response that many of us have to horrendous um, cruelty, whether it's cruelty to animals, whether it's police putting their knee on George Floyd's neck for nine um, minutes. I mean, there's a very visceral response that we all have that is retributivist. It makes perfect sense given um, how we think about these kinds of egregious acts of violence and cruelty to want punishment. But I argue in my chapter, and I'm going to, I'm going to be try to be brief here. I argue that it's that that particular um, response, that particular way of thinking fails to take into account what we really might otherwise imagine, what might be available. Um, and so I suggest that this carceral logic, which is very much um, what I say is <laughs> it sort of colonizes our minds, it makes it hard to think about the other things that might be available. So it's very important that um, even though we have uh, a variety of perspectives in the book, it's very important to Justin and I that it become clear that we're not suggesting that people who do egregious, horribly violent things to animals or other humans should just be walking free. That it's not what abolition is about. And that's not ultimately what Justin and my critique of carceral logics is about. But what it is about is really thinking much more constructively with empirical and qualitative information that currently we don't have available, um, at least in the case of, of animal crimes, we have more of it available in the case of, of crimes against humans, and that we try to imagine other ways of thinking that isn't utopian necessarily, um, that isn't radical in a, in a sense of like, nobody will go for that, but to see the ways in which our system, our current carceral system is not helping people 
not helping animals, and is limiting what it is that we're able to think about in overall improving the conditions of social justice in our world. So that's part of what I do in that chapter, but I wanted to sort of end so we could have more discussion. I know we were supposed to not go that long, so I'll stop. I had a lot more to say. Maybe I could say it in question and answer. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. Larry. I'm sorry, you should, yeah. We'll get this down. Justin, would you like to add anything? No, no, I think we should go to q and I mean, I, the only thing I will say is, I mean, I hope that the, the audience can, can glean this right, but I mean, part of the reason that I think Lori and I have enjoyed working together is, I mean, you hear it. I mean, it's impossible. Is what I what I heard when I first met Lori. Right? It's hard when you're you're reading something. But I mean, Lori is is one of those people and the scholars that I'm that I gravitate towards because she she's truly open, right? She wants to hear things. She wants to be persuaded. Show her a compelling case. Like she wants good results for animals. It's like no one could, could could question that. But is also sort of thinking about well, what what would the data show us? What do these what what do we know through qualitative stories? Uh, and it's sort of seeking the better way. I mean, and that's that's really, I mean, the book is in many ways like a, a discourse that's sort of fumbling towards like, okay, we, we don't have all the answers, but we think there are conversations that should be had and that we should memorialize a history and a trajectory. Um, and in that way, it's it's really not meant to be utopian. And I think that that's a really important point. Right. And I think just, I'm just to say one more thing. Sorry, you're going to have a hard time getting us not to talk. But um, the idea is that, I mean, one of the things that I think is also really motivating me and my thinking about the kinds of carceral responses to animal cruelty is having spent a lot of time in both men's and women's prisons, it's not going to change people's attitudes about animals. And ultimately, one of the things that I think is really important about the work that animal ethics is doing, the work that animal studies is doing, the work that animal law is doing, the work that animal policy should be doing is to change a, as many minds as possible about how to think better about our relationships with animals. And putting people in jail is not going to do that. I, it, it's, not, um, it's not going to have the, that sort of impact. So we have to think otherwise.